everybody. So you're very welcome to the Research Bites today, organized by the UCD Institute of Food and Health. I'm delighted today that uh, Katie Wire is joining us and is going to deliver the Research Bites. So Katie is an agriculture and environmental PhD researcher, and she's studying in the School of Biosystems and Food Engineering. Her supervisor is Tom Curran. So Katie's uh, background is in environmental biology with a BSc in that area and then an MSc in agricultural biotechnology and both her uh, degree and her undergraduate degree and master's were from Dundalk Institute of Technology. So over to you, Katie, I think you're going to speak to us as the title suggests on agricultural <laughs> ammonia and human health. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. So, hello to everybody. Um, I am very thankful for Dolores and Geraldine for having me here today to speak to you all. And big thanks as well for everybody who took time out of their lunch to come and listen to me ramble on. So, my name is Kate Wire. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student in the School of Biosystems and Food Engineering. And my research, as Dolores said, focuses primarily kind of on agriculture and ammonia. And today I want to talk to you about a recent publication that we were able to get out all about how that kind of agricultural ammonia can go on to impact human health. So once we get that working, there we go, let's jump straight into it. So for anyone who might not know, ammonia is a reduced form of nitrogen that is emitted primarily from agriculture. So globally, I think 89% of all our ammonia emissions are a direct result of agricultural activities. And in Ireland, I think that this number currently stands at 99%. So on the island of Ireland, 99% of all our ammonia emissions are directly associated with agricultural activities. The issue with this ammonia is that once it gets into the atmosphere, it can go on then to kind of have quite negative impacts on ecosystems and sensitive habitats and species. And I will be talking about that a little bit further down. But for the moment, I want to bring your attention to all the various kind of sources of ammonia emissions that there are in um, agriculture. So if we take animal housing, for example, the amount of emissions is entirely dependent on, for example, say the animals that you're rearing within the house. What kind of flooring systems there are? Is it slatted? Is it solid concrete? Is there any bedding? Is it straw? Again, is it solid concrete? That all depends. What the ventilation rate is? Is it summer? Is it winter? Um, is the temperature quite high? Is it quite low? That all kind of determines how much emissions and therefore how much concentration of ammonia there is in the surrounding atmosphere. So livestock, for example, um, are in Europe, I think it's 28% of all ammonia emissions in Europe is directly associated with cattle production. 11% um, is associated with pig production, 7% is associated with poultry. So you can kind of see the difference that there is in terms of those sources. As well as that, one of the biggest um, things to consider in terms of ammonia emissions is manure. So slurry, how is it collected, how is it covered? How is it stored and how is it used? So in Europe, 44% of all our ammonia emissions is associated with the spreading of both organic and inorganic fertilizers. And again, that's also heavily dependent on what time of the year it's being spread. Is there rain? Is it windy? Um, what application has been used? Is it splash bay or is it trailing shape? All of those sources, then you can see how many there are, go on to release the ammonia into the atmosphere and it can go on then to have quite um, severe impacts on the ecosystem. So one thing I want to bring your attention to is in Europe, we have these networks called the Natura 2000 networks and they're home to the likes of special protected areas and special areas of conservation where um, sensitive habitats and species uh, exist. And within these Natura 2000 networks, excess pollution, particularly in the form of nitrogen and ammonia inputs, can have really damaging consequences. And some visual, actual, real-life representations here I have to show you. And um, so I took these pictures in Wales and Dundalk, I think it was, so to kind of show real-life impacts that are going on. So these images show what's called lichens, and lichens are often used as bioindicators for nitrogen and ammonia pollution because they're very, very sensitive to changes. On the left in the blue square, you can see a nitrogen sensitive lichen, which is known as osmia. And you can see it's kind of like a silver green color 
it's really fluffy and it's almost described as having like a beard like texture. And the great thing about these types of lichen is that they can absorb up to 20 times their weight in water. So they can have a really good impact on the likes of uh, localized flooding. It can really help with protecting species in these areas. In comparison, um, when there is high levels of ammonia emissions, these nitrogen sensitive lichens will start to die back. And in the red box, you can see a nitrogen tolerant lichen that's called Ventoria, which they can tend to take over and um, really grow very, very quickly. And they will outcompete those nitrogen sensitive lichens. And you can immediately see that they're almost kind of like crusty and scaly in comparison. So instead of absorbing all that excess water, it's now causing it to flow off into the habitats and it can cause species and biodiversity decline. And as I said, they're a very good bioindicator in terms of the second ammonia pollution. So in Europe and across the globe, we have a lot of directives and legislations, policies, rules, regulations in terms of protecting the environment from agricultural pollution, but other anthropogenic sources as well. One I want to bring your attention to is called the National Emissions Ceiling Directive, or the NEC Directive, you might hear me call it in a couple of slides. Um, that requires that there are five major air pollutants which are monitored and reported in European member states. And one of them is ammonia. So just, I will be referring back to that one so we all have it in our heads. So what all of these policies and regulations have in common is that they aim to protect habitats and species and ecosystems from that kind of access or excess agricultural pollution and other anthropogenic pollutions. So they all really focus on the environment. Which kind of brings us on to talking about, well, what about human health? Does ammonia impact human health? And if so, kind of how can we protect against it? And that's where our paper kind of came into place. We actually wrote a literature review, which focused on all of those agricultural um, sources of ammonia. So all of those different ones, uh, how much they kind of pollute and uh, where they come from all across the globe. How then did that ammonia kind of react in the atmosphere to form fine particulate matter? And how both that NH3 and that PM2.5 can go on then and have socioeconomic impacts as well as um, human health impacts, how it can actually typically impact our health. So for again, for anyone that might not know, fine particulate matter is anything that is less than 2.5 microns in diameter. And just to understand exactly how small that is, you can see a single human hair here in this image. And within that is blue dots that are PM10, and that's anything less than 10 microns in diameter. Within those blue dots, you can see those red dots, which are PM2.5, so you can really understand how tiny, tiny that it is. The World Health Organization recommends that exposure to PM2.5 is no more than 10 micrograms per meter cubed. And this is because those really, really fine particulates can actually get really, really deep down into our respiratory tract, into the deep lung tissue, and cause illnesses and um, irritate the respiratory tract. So what does ammonia have to do with any of this PM2.5 stuff? Well, we know that when it enters the atmosphere from agricultural sources, it can react to any other kind of particulates or aerosols that might also be present in the environment. Particularly, I want you to just draw attention to sulfur dioxide or SO2 and nitrogen oxide or NOx. Um, anything in the atmosphere, any other aerosols that might contain sulfuric acid and nitric acid, can actually um, react with that ammonia and create the likes of ammonium nitrates and ammonium sulfates. And a lot of recent literature has actually suggested that those ammonium nitrates, ammonium sulfates, any of those ammonium containing particulates can be very damaging to the deep lung tissue um, in comparison to particulates that might not contain that ammonium. So what we've learned is that that NH3 primarily is emitted from agriculture. Once it gets into the atmosphere, it can react with SO2 and NOx and other particulates and can create fine particulate matter. The more NH3 that there is being released from agriculture or any other sources, the more there is in the atmosphere to react with SO2 and NOx, ergo the higher the concentration of PM2.5 in the atmosphere. But I want to highlight as well, even though NH3 itself can be used up in reactions to create those kind of ammonium particulates, they actually can act as sort of a catalyst as well for reactions between SO2 and NOx, increasing again even further the PM2.5 concentration that there will be. 
So I wish I could go through everything from the paper, but I'll just bring you to some highlights that um, kind of give you an overview of the issue. So one of the papers I want to highlight is by Mali et al in 2021, and they found that for the year 2018, globally, 537,000 premature deaths were a direct result of agricultural PM 2.5. And of that number, 358,000 premature deaths were a direct result of ammonia acting as a precursor to that PM 2.5. So in North America, there in the year 2018, 90% of all premature deaths from agricultural PM 2.5 were directly related to having ammonia as a precursor. And in East and Southeast Asia, it was 80% or 88% of premature deaths, and in Western Europe, it was 79%. So all of those premature deaths obviously have things to do with illnesses. Um, and I want to take a little step back here and just talk about ammonia again. So a study by Holtz et al in 2018 found that children who are exposed to ammonia are 1.7 times more likely to develop asthma than children who aren't exposed, and that's under the age of six years old. But we know that the more and more NH3 that there is in the atmosphere, the more there is to react and create that fine particulate matter, that PM2.5. And for every 10 microgram per meter cubed increase there is, the World Health Organization has suggested that there's an 18% increased risk in developing asthma and a 6 to 13% increased risk of developing cardiopulmonary mortality or a premature death. As well as that, those increased exposures to PM2.5 can cause the likes of lung cancer, and um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart disease, stroke, and it can also exacerbate any other conditions that might already be there. So all of this human health impact, all of these illnesses and these premature deaths can actually have quite high socioeconomic costs to economies. So I'm just going to compare here the European member states and North America just um, to be able to give you a quick visualisation. So these numbers here are to do with the economic losses directly due to ammonia emissions. So for every kilogram of ammonia that's emitted in Europe, it can cost the economy between 2 and 36 euro, where in America it can be between 8 and 64 euro. Those costs are directly associated with um, the likes of loss of days earnings from illnesses, um, the actual services, the cost to the health services, and as well as that loss of earning due to loss of life. So if we're talking about how can we fix this issue? Well, there's loads of abatement measures that we can actually put in place already to reduce NH3, but of course it's going to cost something. So that NEC directive we were talking about earlier, they set limits for the amount that each member state is allowed to kind of emit in terms of ammonia. So to ensure that every member state is emitting no more than those limits, it would cost uh, European members as a whole about 70 to 90 million euro to ensure that those abatement measures are in place. In North America, it's a bit more complicated. Um, for every kilogram of nitrogen that there is, it would cost about 80 cents, three euro. Um, to reduce ammonia to a level that's kind of considered low. So it can seem like a lot of money to be paying to focus on one very small particular pollutant, but if you look at the savings in terms of the impact that it can actually have, it can save the European economy 75.6 billion euro in terms of those health costs, so those illnesses, loss of days earnings, premature deaths, and in America it can actually save 40 euro for every kilogram of ammonia that's emitted. So why focus on ammonia? Just why not everything else that we're so used to? Um, it's actually because the last slide you can kind of see, it's really cost effective. It's a cost effective high impact way to ensure that we're reducing the amount of PM2.5 that's being created to reduce those health issues, those associated costs. A lot of studies have actually also recently suggested that ammonia is one of the most efficient ways to reduce PM2.5 in terms of both how high impact, low cost it is, but also the fact that it's that kind of um, catalyst for SO2 and NOx. And if we focus on ammonia alone, it actually costs only 10% that of what it would cost to put the same impact into SO2 and NOx reduction. But if we look on the right hand side, you can see again that European NEC directive. These were the reduction targets for 2020. And they were hoping that this would be reduced in comparison to a 2005 baseline level. So the emphasis was really, really placed on SO2 and NOx. You can see it was um, for 2020, it was a 59% reduction in SO2, 
uh, 42% reduction in NOx and only a 6% reduction in NH3. So, I mean, it's inherent. We all know about SO2, we know about NOx, we know about methane and carbon and all of those that we kind of associate with global warming and climate change and pollution. Um, but the link between PM2.5 and NH3 is really only kind of a new um, area of research and it's already come out. So hopefully that will balance itself out in future policies. Oh, sorry, another thing I wanted to mention was it's an issue because an awful lot of European member states at the moment are exceeding those NEC limits for ammonia. Ireland is one of them. We've been exceeding our limits for ammonia since 2016. And this is an issue because ammonia is really heavily dependent on climate and temperature and seasonality. And that brings us then into our current climate crisis. So where there is increases in temperature, there is going to be increases in emissions ergo increases in concentrations and the formation of PM2.5. So Sutton et al. in 2013 actually suggested that if there was a five degree, five degree Celsius global increase in temperature, it would mean there could be a 42% increase in um, ammonia emissions across the globe. And what this would mean for Europe alone is that there'd be about a 4% increase in current premature deaths that's associated with PM2.5. So it kind of really highlights the need to um, act now and to ensure that we're already implementing those mitigation measures, because if we try to do it in the future, it's not really going to have the impact that we needed to have, what with the increase in temperatures and the changes in weather at the moment. So again, I just want to highlight it's, it's a real need to act now thing. If we keep going with our business as usual approach that we currently have, Anything that we decide to do in the future is kind of going to be offset by this climate crisis if we continue the way that we're going. And you can see as well that PM2.5 resulting from ammonia concentrations is a global issue. It's nowhere that's localised. There's no one particular area that's suffering. It's anywhere that there's going to be agriculture, there's going to be ammonia and there's going to be this issue. So we can see that reducing ammonia to reduce PM2.5 is actually quite high impact and low cost in comparison to some other uh, pollutants. And one thing I really want to drive home is that we should really, really start to consider policies and legislations from a combined approach and not have environment here and health here. It should be that we impact everything together, that we understand the whole process as a whole source. And that can lead to kind of better policies that will protect both the environment and the human health. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from the uh, paper that we recently released. And it's again reiterating that point. So regulation surrounding ammonia as a precursor to PM2.5 formation is lacking currently and should be incorporated into future policy and regulations across the globe to aid in bettering human health from PM2.5 exposure. So I did promise there's the DOI if anybody else wants to have a little bit more further reading. And these are my contact details. If anybody wants any more questions or to talk to me about anything, feel free. I'm always open. And just to highlight as well, if you want some light, fun nighttime reading, um, my two supervisors, Tom and David, actually released a comic all about ammonia. And um, I think it's in over 16 languages. So feel free to have a note of that as well. That's me, Dolores. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks, Holm.